Perfect. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Mona Ali. I'm your District 7 Manager with the Mayor's Office. I'm gonna go ahead and also introduce my team, Ms. Alexia Davis and Sammy El Hadi, my Deputy Manager and Business Liaison. <laughs> and all our fellow Dons in the, in the crowd. Um, and I'll be handing it over to Deacon Brown to say a few words and thank you for having us in your house today. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Cadis, and I just want to say, uh, you know, respect the church, respect the mayor and his staff, and respect yourselves. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, respect yourself, respect the staff, respect the church, and I'll bow our head in prayer. We come to you this, more, uh, this evening just to say thank you. Thank you for another day. Thank you for allowing us to see this day. Bless us on this day. Bless God and keep us. Bless our mayor, bless this uh, organization. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Deacon Brown. And now we'll bring up Mayor, Mayor Mike Duggan. Okay. Oh. Can I use the other one? Uh, uh, well, good evening. Normally, sorry, it's supposed to be already on. Uh, normally, we have the council member from the district. Uh, I don't see Councilman Durhall yet, but I do see the council president, Mary Sheffield. Madam President, would you like to come up and bring some words of greeting? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. District 7, how are you feeling this evening? Good, good. Uh, I am Council President Mary Sheffield. Welcome to the Mayor's Charter Mandated Meeting. Uh, on behalf of Council Member Durha, who is my colleague and friend, we thank him for all the work that he is doing in District 7. I personally wanted to be here because we're talking about community violence intervention, uh, which is something I am super uh, passionate about. Uh, I cannot wait to see the results and the data uh, of this particular program that we are able to fund through ARPA funding. And so ask all the questions that you have, uh, being engaged, but I think this is a very innovative approach that we have to uh, providing a preventative tool to address the gun violence in the city of Detroit. So thank you all for being here. And again, on behalf of Councilmember Durhall, because this is his district, we welcome you and thank you all for being here. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, so for those who haven't uh, been to one of these before, uh, we're going to do a presentation to start with. Then we'll take questions and we'll alternate questions from the audience and from those watching online. Uh, we're going to talk tonight uh, about a new initiative on reducing gun violence. But before we get to that, I have a couple of areas I want to update the residents of District 7 uh, and the folks in this community of things that are of particular importance. And the first one is the big windstorm that we had last Thursday. And we're off to a good start with the clicker. All right, well, they sort this out, I'll tell you about it. Uh, so uh, it is becoming obvious uh, that these storms that we're getting are more and more real. I mean, climate change is real, uh, and trees went down all over the city. And so what we did uh, was set up uh, an emergency response Thank you. Uh, I must be pointing it the wrong way. Okay, when you figure it out, let me know. All right, somebody smarter than me. Thank you, Mona, isn't she a great manager? All right. So, uh, we are now gonna start to treat these storms with emergency responses. Uh, and get this stuff cleaned up. I don't want these branches and these trees uh, laying around this city for months. Uh, so we put 30 crews on the street over the weekend. I know you saw them out there. We have a commitment. We're going to get everything up in two weeks. It's going to be a different standard. So if you have branches, trees, and the like for the next two weeks, just take them right out to the curb okay, and leave them there. Uh, and our crews, GFL Waste Management, have committed to extra folks. They're not uh, limiting how many yards you can put out. They'll pick up whatever's there. We will send 
uh, another 30 crews out, we will get everything. And I noticed driving around the city, I saw a couple people this weekend uh, cutting down some trees that were still up. I think they figured out that this is your two-week pass because we announced there'll be no tickets for the next two weeks. Uh, so if you do have uh, trees and stuff, this is your chance to get them. Uh, and now we're going to progress from there. I want to have response teams to deal with the fact that traffic lights are out. Some of those traffic lights are on state roads, some are on city roads, but we have to deal with the climate of this century, and the climate of this century is going to be a lot of storms, uh, and we have to respond to it faster, not complain uh, about the weather, and this is going to be a good test. But two weeks from now, and I've been really pleased what I've seen out of our, our workers over the weekend, uh, we're going to have this completely cleaned up. But we need to do more to deal with climate change. We've all seen the horror that happened in the fire in Hawaii. A tropical storm hit California. We're seeing tornadoes here in Michigan. Uh, and we're not just going to talk about fighting climate change. In Detroit, we're doing something about it. And I want to update you from the presentation I did in June about our solar fields. Uh, and as you know, uh, this is the solar field right here in District 7, about two miles east of here in O'Shea Park. District 7 was the first, but now it's going to end up being the model. Uh, and so in June, we said uh, we are going to go wherever neighborhood groups want us. The city's not going to put a solar field any place. We're not going to pick the site. Only if the neighborhoods come forward will we consider you. Uh, and I'm glad to say at this point, we have 19 neighborhoods that have said we've got largely abandoned area near us that we would like to have solar fields. And these meetings are happening every day, 19 different neighborhoods where the neighbors are planning what they want to see in their community. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it with the, the sun coming in, but those red boxes are the boxes, all the neighborhoods all over the city. Uh, there are two in District 7. Uh, one is in the O'Shea neighborhood where the original uh, solar field was, and I'm very impressed. The people who know the most about solar fields are looking to expand. They, they see the value. And then a uh, neighborhood group in the Narden Park uh, area have been the two in District 7 that have come forward. And here's kind of the areas in District 7 that they're looking at. And you can see the kind of uh, acreage that we want. Areas that have been sites of frequent illegal dumping, sites of prostitution, sites of all kinds of activity where neighbors have been frustrated for years that nothing is going on, uh, and they're deciding whether they want to create solar fields and have the benefit. And so we have 19 sites. We're going to pick eight or nine of them this November. So if all 19 submit, we'll pick the best eight or nine. Some, the neighbors may decide in the next month they don't want to go ahead. That's okay. Uh, but I'm confident we're going to have plenty. The proposed sites right now cover 860 acres. We need 250 acres to power every city building. So already what's in consideration is far more than I could have imagined, but it also tells you the desire of people in many parts of the city to see, see something productive done uh, with the land. In the areas they've picked out, there's an average of less than one owner-occupied house per block. You know what kind of blocks we're talking about when there's one house left. And these are the areas that the folks who live nearby say this would be the right kind of place. And so the proposals are due back by October 31st, and we're going to select the proposals that get us the best 250 acres. So if you live in an area and you're invited, uh, you should come to the meetings and give your input. So. Uh, the biggest thing these groups are talking about is that we are going to pay a community benefit of $25,000 an acre for the neighbors in the surrounding area. And the neighbors right now are in rooms making their own proposals. Some want to have uh, a new community park. A number want home improvement grants, energy efficient grants for their homes to get a new furnace or better windows or the like. That's something. Uh, that you can propose. Some are interested in having solar powers on, on their roof uh, so that they can uh, get a significant break on their energy bill. And it probably won't surprise you, one of the things we're getting asked about is generators for their homes. 
uh, which is now becoming a hot topic. These are things that neighbors can propose based on what they've got. You have to be within 2,000 feet of the zone to be participating in this. These are for the people who live nearby. Uh, but to give you an idea, folks who are proposing a 25-acre site, they're going to have $625,000 of community benefits to decide how to spend. We have some proposing 50-acre sites. They're going to have $1,300,000. We're not going to tell the neighbors what the community benefit plan is. They're going to propose it, develop it themselves in these community meetings, which is why it's important for you to participate. Uh, and I couldn't have done this two years ago. The numbers didn't work. But when President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act a year ago, it means there's a 30 to 50 percent federal subsidy for all this. That's what makes this economical for us. The president has decided uh, that this country needs to address climate change. And I've had a chance to meet with the president about this. I've had a chance to meet with the energy secretary, a woman by the name of Jennifer Granholm, known well to us. And they are helping guide us so that Detroit will be the national demonstration of how we can do this. So if you live inside the proposed zone, we're going to take the property. There will be condemnation. Uh, and that means that the people who are applying have to show us there is significant support from the people who live in the zone. I don't want to have a whole lot of people who wanted to stay and push them out. That's not what we want to do. And so here are the benefits. If you are a landlord, you got vacant land, we'll pay you fair market value. If you're a renter in the zone, we will pay to move you and pay 18 months rent for a comparable home within a few miles. In our conversation so far, the renters are pretty much all in favor of this. They all want the 18 months free rent. That's, that one is going pretty easy. The owner-occupied houses are the ones I'm concerned about, folks who have often been here two and three generations. Uh, and so we are going to do everything possible to treat those folks fairly. And in many cases, we might be able to just go right around them and leave them, because we don't have to, with the solar field, necessarily take every single parcel. But we're going to offer them twice fair market value for their house. And as we've been knocking on doors, this is Detroit. Some want to stay no matter what. Most people are saying, what's the price? Because they know nobody is likely to come into these neighborhoods knocking on the door offering to pay them twice the value of their home again. But these are going to be sensitive conversations. We're going to tell people what they can expect on their price by the end of September so they can come to the meetings and say, I'm being treated fairly, I'm not being treated fairly, and they can have a conversation with their neighbors because we are going where there is the most support. We are not going where people don't want a solar field. Um, so uh, you have until October 31st and decide you want to take a neighborhood that looks like that and turn it into that. That should not be the city's decision. That should be the people who live in the community's decision. And that's the way we're going to operate. So please watch for notices if you live in one of those areas. I want to talk to you now about what many of you came to hear. And that is, what are we doing with the unacceptable level of violence in this city? And I'm going to start by saying this. I think Chief White and the Detroit Police Department are doing an outstanding job. Right? And last uh, November, we had 300 vacancies of police officers because we weren't paying competitively. With the support of City Council, I'm glad to see Council Member Durhall, who sponsored it here now, we were able to give our officers $10,000 raises. We've already filled 150 of those. And with the academy classes filling up, by early next year, all 300 officers will be out on the street. But already, you're seeing more and more patrols. If you've seen what's happened this summer, uh, these illegal block parties where all across America you're seeing stories of 8, 10, 12, 19 people shot at a block party at 2 or 3 in the morning. You've seen the Detroit police out into every neighborhood going to these block parties saying, you don't have a permit, you can't block the street. Our officers are having the courage to go in and deal with this neighborhood by neighborhood. But it's not enough. 
They're headed the right direction, and I want to take one more minute to give them credit for the credit that they deserve. So the violent crime this year with the extra officers is going down. Uh, and so if you look at through yesterday, from last year to this year, homicides were 200 last year, 179 this year, down 11 percent. Shootings down 8 percent. Carjackings are down 28 percent. Greenlight has been a remarkable story. Carjackings are down about 80 percent over the last five or six years. And so in most years, the mayor and the police chief would stand up and say, success. Look at that. We're, we're down on crime. I do not believe the level of violence in this city is acceptable. That is not success. And we're going to try to do something more, and I'll show you why. Every city in America is not experiencing the same level of violence that we are. There's quite a range. There are cities that are more violent than Detroit, and there are cities that are a lot less violent than Detroit. And I'll show you through the first of August. This year, we all share numbers with each other. But if you just take cities basically in the 600,000 population range, just about our range, Memphis had 190 homicides, Baltimore 165, Detroit 154, Washington, D.C. 150. We're no longer uh, the highest homicide rate. But let me show you a few other cities. Milwaukee had 105, Louisville 80, Boston 26. Boston has the same level of population as the city of Detroit. And through July, Boston had 26 homicides, and we had 154. Boston has drugs. Boston has gangs. What Boston does not have is a culture of using guns to settle your beefs. I was the prosecutor 20 years ago. I studied what they did in Boston. In the early 1990s, you know what they did? They had a 10-point plan. They did the things that we did with the U.S. attorney and the police and the prosecutor all bonding together, but they did something else. They brought community activist groups and churches together and said, let's reach out before there's violence. This was the 1990s. We are 30 years later. They changed the culture where people in Boston decided, I've got kids of my own. I've got little brothers and sisters. We don't have to settle our disputes with violence. And so we decided we are going to try something on a level nobody has tried it. Uh, and we'll see uh, if we can change the city of Detroit, if this turns out to be our moment. And so we committed, with city council's full support, $10 million, not for the police department, but for activists who are in the community, are part of the community, who know the community. And we're going to turn them loose to interact with uh, people who might be prone to violence and see if they can't do what we call, calling them shot stoppers. Could they stop the shots from occurring? And so what's a community violence initiative? It's talked about a lot in the country. And there's a really mixed research on whether it works or not. But here's the basic principle, that these community groups can build relationships uh, to prevent the violence before it occurs. And a lot of times, the individuals we need to reach don't have a relationship with the government don't have a relation with the police, may distrust the government and the police. But could we pick trusted members from the community and have them do the work up front? That's the principle behind community violence intervention. And Councilman Durhall, who chair the, uh, the Violence Prevention Task Force, please stand up. OK? Huge supporter. And the Council President Sheffield, Council President Pro Tem Tate, also were on this. So again, there are people in this city who want the mayor and council to fight with each other. Uh, but that's not how you change the direction of the city. This was something where we worked together. And I don't know if you can see this map, but these yellow shades are where the violence has been for the last five years. We mapped it out. It actually hasn't changed that much. Now, as most of you know, people outside the city say Detroit's violent. In the city, the story is very different. There are some neighborhoods in this city that are very safe, that you think nothing about uh, taking a walk at night. There are other neighborhoods in the city where you can go to sleep to the sound of gunfire every night. And so we said, we're going to try something that hasn't been done. 
What if we took the most violent areas and went to our most accomplished activist groups and said, you go in to the toughest zones? And 25 groups came forward, outstanding proposals. Uh, Deputy Mayor Todd Bettison and his team ran the process. And it was a hard time whittling it down. But we picked these six most outstanding proposals, and we did something interesting. We said, you're going to be responsible for one area. Nobody's ever done this. And so over in the Denby area, uh, we had a coalition of Wayne Metro, Denby, uh, Neighborhood Alliance, and Camp Restore. And in that green boundary, that is their zone. Their job is to spend all their time in disputes in that zone, knowing who's angry with who, who's getting ready to retaliate against who, who's angry but is looking for a job. Uh, and they're just out there doing what they're doing because they had to make money. Let's get them on a different path. Right next door is Ray Winans, Detroit Friends and Family in the Seven and Gratiot area, one of the toughest neighborhoods of the city. He's done great work for a long time. Now we're putting real resources uh, behind him. Uh, over up in the 8th Precinct, Detroit People's Community. And the next three all have a piece of District 7. And I'm going to let you get a chance to hear from them tonight about what they're doing in your district. They started August 1st. Now, it's not like we signed a contract with them in September, everybody stops uh, what they've been doing. This is going to take six months before we start to see the results. But you're already seeing these groups uh, established community centers start to renovate them. I was just at New Eras. Uh, uh, just beautiful the way they're, they're setting up, and so are the others. And so New Era uh, is extending down District 7 along Hubble. That's going to be their zone. Uh, Detroit 300 uh, has taken the zone around Plymouth and Southfield. Uh, and Force Detroit is now down in the area around Warrendale. If you live in one of those areas, you are going to be interacting with these groups for the next two years, hopefully on a regular basis. Uh, and it's fascinating. Uh, because New Era, for example, yesterday, uh, we didn't tell them what to do. They came out, and they have a new app. They came up with it on their own, so the people in the area can communicate with each other. They're developing a sense of community in a way that I would not have imagined. This is the kind of creativity uh, that we are looking for. And so right now, we are being looked at all around the country. This is American Rescue Plan money. Uh, the president is interested in this because we've done three things nobody else has done. And nobody's going to judge us until we produce results that we don't. But here are the three things nobody else has tried. One, everybody has their own boundary. Today, in the community violence initiatives, people do midnight basketball. They do interventions, et cetera, all across the city. When crime goes up, people say, it's not my fault. When crime goes down, they said, I did it. Uh, and you're never really sure. By having defined boundaries, we will see what's working, what's not. And the six are working together. They're not competing with each other. When they're doing things that work, they're going to share those ideas with the others. Second, they got to write their own plan. This is the first place the city didn't tell them what to do. Because I don't know as much as the folks who are in the neighborhoods every day. They don't need me to tell them how to do the plan. They wrote their own plans. And there's a third piece they can earn bonus funding of double their quarterly payments if they can bring the violence down faster than the rest of the city. And here's an interesting thing. 40% of all the shootings are in their six zones. So the potential to change this uh, is there for them. And we're going to see uh, how this works. Uh, and I want you now to get a chance uh, to hear from the folks who have done it. The man who has led this from beginning to end, he used to be the deputy chief of the police department. I recruited him. Chief White's still mad at me uh, to go over and be deputy mayor. Please welcome Deputy Mayor Todd Bettison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, going, going to the second bullet point that the mayor really highlighted as far as they had an opportunity, each group, to design, create their own plan. Well, I, I will tell you this, the mayor and I had many conversations and I would come in with my ideas, retiring from the police department, I was going to police it up. You know, I was going to have it looking kind of like a DPD thing. He was like, no, Todd, no, 
they're the experts. They've been out there with the community violence intervention piece of it. And so that was a difficult thing, but I had to definitely trust them. I will say this before I bring the groups up so that you can hear from them, is the fact that I'm so proud of this because during my 27 year career, but really over the last 15 years, um, regardless of what chief of police it was, we had to call and rely on these groups. You know, and you may have saw, the media has seen, you've seen as well, that when Chief White or whether it was Chief Craig or whatever chief it was that was standing there, you would often see a Detroit 300 right there. I've had to call New Era to say we need help with this. I've had to call these various groups who have been out there in the streets working. And what I can tell you is they always showed up. I used to call them like they worked for us or something. Never so much ever had anything to really give. They did it out of a volunteer spirit. Never even gave them a gas card. They burned their own gas. And I know that they have prevented shootings. I know that they have prevented violence. Now, with the proper resources, I know that they can do so much more. And so that's why I'm so proud of the American Rescue Plan Act dollars. Dollars that have allowed us to be able to do this. So, these are the groups right here that are here in District 7, New Air Detroit. Detroit 300 and Force Detroit. At this point, I'm going to bring up the president of New Era, Zeke. And you'll get a chance. <laughs> to hear from my good brother. Peace and love, peace and love. Or what up, though? We in Detroit, right? Um, okay, so uh, I first and foremost want to, um, you know, thank everybody for coming out, being able to have community forums like this and people actually show up. You know, that's a big thing. Um, I always talk about the engagement piece from the community and the community being involved. That's extremely important. Um, I appreciate the mayor's office and um, everybody who had a hand in, in, in the crime and violence initiative, uh, too, as well. Um, you know, crime and violence uh, in our communities is nothing new, um, but figuring out different ways um, to kind of tackle these issues, we need to make sure that we put ourselves in a position to do so. So um, for us, um, you know, we've been out in the community going on, um, well, we're moving in on our 10th year uh, of being out in the community. Um, we are uh, boots on the ground. I tell people we work from January to December. Uh, we've been doing this without funds. Um, and we've been making it work, you know, um, we've been doing it what we can for ourselves and our people in our community um, and been making it work because that's what we should be doing um, as a people, as a culture anyway. Um, we got to be able to look ourselves in the mirror uh, and put um, into perspective what we want our communities to be like and not always have it be something to where we complaining uh, every time something happened. Um, I always tell people this uh, when it comes to crime and violence. Uh, when it comes to um, a lot of the negative things that go on in our communities. And this is facts. There are way more people who have good sense and want better from our people and from our community than there is people that's doing reckless crime um, and tearing up our community. The problems that we are having as a culture and as a community is that the people that are doing crimes in our community are much more active than the people who want more and want better from our communities. It's simple math. More people get involved in the community, more people want to do better, make it a collective effort. So our approach is always accountability across the board, starting with ourselves, self-accountability, putting yourself in a position to want more and to do more, and then moving throughout the community as well. This is not just a, a group thing, um, and I'm, I'm sure I can speak for all groups involved in this, is that they're going to need community support. This is not just a, a particular group going out saying, okay, we about to tackle crime on our own. You know, we need the people in the business community to step up and be accountable, particularly these businesses that have, um, you know, let people loiter outside, um, you know, gas stations, liquor stores, these places that are, are havens for crime in our community, you know, have to have a certain level of accountability 
community, if they want to do business, uh, business in our community, we want to make sure that we get the residents involved. I'm not coming down your block to help, um, you know, uh, uh, structure, protect uh, your community, clean up your community, and you don't think that you're going to get involved in this process. This is about accountability, all of us looking ourselves in the mirror and figuring out what we can do better realistically, because I can tell you this, as babies are being born today, we have to be able to say what type of world are we going to leave behind from the, for them. And us in this position, it's took years and years and years and years for us to get where we are today. Make no mistake about it. It took a lot of time for us to, be, to get uh, uh, in the position that we're in. And it's going to take some time to get out. It's not just a wave of magic wand, give some community groups some funds, and then instantly it happens. But through strategy, through consistency, through organization, um, through persistence and dedication, we can make it a point to where we can see change realistically in our community. But people have to be on board. This is not just a, a, a one band thing. So people have to want more, want to do better, help these groups out. Um, big shout out to all the groups involved. Like they said, there's no competition. We all just trying to figure out different ways to go about um, tackling these issues and I believe that we can do it with the right support and the right uh, resources and we just looking to organize strategize and plan so anything that you uh, any of you who are in our district uh, need from us our district spans from um, Curtis uh, to Schoolcraft um, from uh, Hubble all the way down to Wyoming so if anybody live in those districts, um, we actually have a hub on Schoolcraft, 19010 Schoolcraft. Um, it'll, it'll be fully operational. It'll start next week. Um, if you have any uh, uh, greats with the community, any ideas you want to get involved, we look for more people to get involved, right? Um, and, and just come out and be a part of this process. Um, we literally are in the middle of our training right now, so we are literally moving through the community as we speak, but we want to make sure that we uh, came here, um, you know, been visible, and then make sure that people know, you know, when they see us, understand, like, we moving with love, we moving with unity. Um, and I just appreciate everybody uh, and looking forward to building with you guys in the future. Thank you. Definitely, thank you, Zeke, New Air Detroit. Um, that, that is just amazing, the innovation that has come into it. I mean, actually creating the app. They just had their press conference to announce the app, and so I um, want you all to check that out as well. The next group really needs no introduction. They've been around for, I mean, as long as I can really remember. And so Detroit 300, I'm going to, 15 years. I thought it was longer than that. Uh, so I'm, I thought it was like 25 years. And so, um, thank you, Mother Bernice. And if this, Mother Bernice would know, because you was an original member, right? Give it up for Mother Bernice. <laughs> you gotta have somebody fact checking you. And so, at this point, I'd like to bring up the president, and then also Mr. Raphael B. Washington, I mean, Johnson, so it's Raphael and Eric Ford, Detroit 300 past president and current president. Let's give it up for them. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, as everybody know me, I'm allergic to this mic. One day I'm gonna lock everybody up in a room, they ain't gonna come out until I'm ready. <laughs> but uh, our zone is from Southfield to Chicago to Hubble to Puritan and back down to Southfield which I do the zone at night by myself. Not by myself, I have guys out there, but I like doing the zone so I can see everything in the area. The four, you know, the, what is that? The four stores that's still open at the 12, the two clubs that's going on, nothing going on Puritan, the, f the three gas stations on Puritan. I do it all. So I'm not gonna be but a second on this mic because everybody know that, uh, everybody think Arthur Edge and Mr. Blue and everybody else the president of the organization. That don't, I, don't, I don't care about that. Because it's like four speakers before you get to me. Now it's two, so I'm working. <laughs> but saying that, I was just saying that I, I, I worry about the neighborhoods. That's where my voice is powerful. Powerful. But I'm turning this thing over to when this thing first happened, I was thinking about one person I can have come in here and do the proposal for us and who got a heart like mine. And a week before this happened, me and him had some words. And I'm like, I know somebody hires who's still in this thing. So the founder of Detroit 300, Dr. Raphael B. Johnson. 
Thank you, E40. Uh, since we are in the house of worship, it's only appropriate for me to begin uh, giving homage and deference to the one God to whom none of us in this building can be more grateful enough for his intervention in our affairs to give us life today because somebody somewhere else didn't wake up this morning. And for that, we can give God a hand clap, can't we? <clears throat> of course, I want to thank the mayor. No other mayor has done this. We've had a bunch of favorite mayors, but you have taken this to another level and allowed us to be able to exemplify and personify what we've always done with a little bit of money behind us. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And thank you to the CVI team uh, representing the city of Detroit. All right? And y'all know who y'all are, that team, that row right there. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, it's been a long time coming for this organization. When we started this, you know, uh, there were some mixed, mixed views from the community. Uh, you had some that said we were vigilantes, although there was not one violent act committed by the Detroit 300 in nearly 15 years. Then you had another side that said we were agent provocateurs. These were the revolutionaries who said that we were working for the police. And that was inaccurate. We never got a dime from the police. We didn't work for the police. We worked with the police. And I don't care who you are, at some point in your life, you're going to call 911. It could be your grandma fell down the stairs. It could be somebody breaking in. You're going to call 911. So again, that myth was scratched out of here as well. So this organization uh, has been in the, in the making and the work with this particular uh, CVI. Before there was a CVI, there was Detroit 300. There was no such thing as CVI. And we started this with a small tag group of individuals who had a really uh, courageous heart and a persevering spirit to see their city do better. As it pertains to what we're doing now as far as canvas and neighborhood, that's been a, a model for the Detroit 300 historically. The methodology of the Detroit 300 is to provide a presence in the community. You see the orange shirts, you see the black writing, you see the orange hats, you see the orange hoodies. That presence in itself helps decrease crime in your neighborhood because we come in through with amber oscillating lights, we come in through with uh, reflective uh, magnets on the vehicles, we come in through with board horns, and more importantly, we come in through shaking hands and knocking on doors. And that is the presence, the presence that we're providing inside the community in our CV, CVI area because it has worked in the past and with a little bit of money, it can work a little bit more. Um, we have a campaign that we're launching with this initiative. And that campaign, oh, where's, the, where's the, the lawn sign? Come on, brother, you gotta be on point. <laughs> that campaign is simply stop the shooting. You can bring, you can bring the, the, the uh, poster up as well. So support 4A227, which is our CVI, and stop the shooting. Protect our women, children, and senior citizens. That has been the model for Detroit 300 since its inception. Our objective is to provide a shots intervention service for the city of Detroit in that particular area in 4A227. What does that mean? That means when someone has beef, when they have issues, when they have conflict, they can call that number and we can step in to help resolve that number. We will not, they can remain anonymous. They can come to us. We're not gonna have the police waiting for you to uh, arrest you or question you. If we can solve that, then you'll never have to see the police. You'll never have to get arrested. You'll never have to be questioned because we resolved it at the community level. So again, we're going to be, you're gonna be seeing these signs almost in every house. There's posters that are gonna be posted up. There's flyers that we're gonna put in every single hand in those individual residents in that area. It's sort of like campaigning, and it is like campaigning. Those of you who run elections and ran elections, this is a campaign. It's any type of movement for people, mass movement of individuals, you have to campaign to get them people to move in the right direction. You want somebody to vote for you? You have to shake their hands. You have to get them to believe in your ideas. You have to get them to believe in your concepts. Well, we're taking on the same methodology in this particular CVI zone because we want the individuals who take these flyers, who take these lawn signs, who take these posters to believe in the idea of stopping the shots. And we can stop the shots before they get fired. If we believe in this as a community, and if we're doing this and they're seeing us, then we definitely can make an impact. Another uh, evidence-based methodology that we use is radio patrols, okay? We use repeater radios that we communicate all over the city, but specifically in the CVI zone, 24 hours a day. That's something that has worked for us in the past. Now we're able to pay individuals to patrol. Last, before this, we were having individuals volunteering. So now we have the resources 
to be in those communities every single day, 24 hours a day, having some type of presence in the community around the clock. So the SHOTS intervention piece, we're providing a visual. I think Zeke said that just a few minutes ago. Not just the presence of individuals or bodies, but there have to be a visual. If you know anything about crime, anything about violence, anything about what ticks individual or what causes an individual to pick up a gun, to carry a gun, and aim that gun at someone else that he don't know, and shoot the individual, and then go home and eat cornflakes afterwards. You know that that's a psychological problem. If you want someone to be something, they have to see it. So we provide the visual so that he can see it. What do you mean by that? Well, let's look at this. Sound travels at 1,120 feet per second. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So scientifically and naturally, that means that what we see has more of a precept than what we hear. People don't want to hear you talking, they want to see you about it. And so as we see these in the community, you'll see a psychological response, a subconscious response. I'll give you an example. A few years ago when the city of Detroit, the school districts had a, a decrease in enrollment, there was a campaign initiative under that leadership at that time that was embarked upon. That campaign leadership, that marketing, we saw what? Around the city we saw blue doors. Y'all remember that? Do. Blue doors everywhere. And there was some words on the blue doors that says, I'm in. Y'all remember that? That wasn't too long ago, right? Come on, y'all remember that? Yeah. I'm in. So we bought in to being, I'm in. Even if we're not in school, even if we're far away from being involved in the educational system, it was our spirit that said, you know what, I'm in. And guess what? It worked at that time. The enrollment increased. So the same methodology that they took in trying to increase the enrollment and providing the awareness in our city with the, with the school districts is the same initiative. We want to splatter the 48227 with the, shots, the shot, Stop the Shots intervention services offered by the Detroit 300. Because in order for you want, if you wanted them to be it, they have to see it. I'm done, thank you. Appreciate y'all. And at this moment, before we get to our next group, I want to bring up the chair of the Gun Violence Prevention um, Task Force, Council Member Fred Durhall. This is your district. Come up here. I'll give you an opportunity to say a few words, and I'm going to let you introduce Force Detroit, Zoe. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, D7. D7 is in the house. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here, obviously, uh, our council president, uh, our mayor, uh, deputy mayor, who, by the way, let me tell you, has been very instrumental in what you are seeing tonight. Uh, I remember the conversation of him sitting down and we're saying, how are we going to tackle uh, this issue? Uh, how are we going to create data uh, to hold folks responsible as well? These are your taxpayer dollars. But most importantly, how are we going to, how are we going to create uh, comprehensive programs uh, that really address the issues of gun violence. Uh, and since this process has started, uh, you know, one of the things that I always remember as we look at these numbers and we talk about crime going down is that when you see those particular numbers, it's easy to forget that there are actual lives that are attached to those numbers. There are emotions that are attached to those numbers, people's families, brothers, sisters, mothers, daughters attached to those numbers. And so from the Gun Violence Task Force perspective, we've been taking that very seriously, co-chairing with Council President Sheffield, Council President Pro Tem Tate. Uh, we will be releasing our first task force report in a month. Uh, we've been working very hard on that. But through this entire process, let me tell you this, uh, so our residents know here in the city of Detroit, whether it's our community, whether it is Detroit Police Department, whether it's the mayor's office or our entire Detroit City Council, we are taking the violence in our communities very seriously. We want to utilize all resources that are available to us. We want to utilize unconventional methods that have never been tried before because we understand again that there are actual lives attached to those statistics and we just do not look at it 
as statistics. So no matter what folks may think, understand we are taking this very seriously. Uh, and that being said, I've learned a lot about community violence intervention, otherwise known as CVI, since I started this process. Uh, I, I called it something else at one time, now I call it CVI, uh, based off of the next group that I'm going to uh, introduce, who has also been very instrumental in helping us with our task force report. Uh, this group has traveled to Washington, D.C., uh, been in the White House, as well as some of our other groups as well. Uh, but there's one particular brother in this group that really stuck out to me. Uh, and, and I have to acknowledge a couple folks, Mr. Ray Winans, who was in the back as well. They don't service this side, but they service the east side of Detroit. But I was introduced to this brother from Ray Winans. He said, I got a real serious guy in your area you need to meet. So when I met Zoe, we sat down, and the first thing he said, if you're serious about gun violence, I hope you're not one of these fake guys. And I said, well, what do you mean one of these fake guys? He said, you know, man, those guys that just talk, 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 but no action. I said, well, I, he said, well, where do you grow up? Where did you grow up? I said, I grew up two blocks from Dexter. I grew up from the hood. Okay, it's Russell Woods, but it's still the hood, <laughs> as, as they would say. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we just hit it off from the first moment uh, because of his sincerity. And one of the things that stuck with me was that he said, you know, we can go into these neighborhoods and do things that the Detroit Police Department cannot do because we have a level of trust, but we've also been there. We've got skin in the game, we got credibility. And that was something that stuck out with me uh, because their actions, and I know this for a fact about community violence intervention because I've seen it with my own two eyes, whether I'm rolling with Ray or rolling with Zoe, and they're stopping folks from murdering folks. This is real. This is real. I've seen it with my own two eyes, but uh, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Zoe from Force Detroit, and also, uh, if she's standing up, she's not gonna speak, but Ms. Alea Harvey Quinn as well, who has been doing such amazing work. <laughs> and before I would do that, we cannot also do some of this work without our state par partners and want to recognize State Representative Stephanie Young, who is in attendance tonight as well. So, Zoe, thank you, brother, for everything you do. It's yours. How are everybody doing tonight? Uh, first and foremost, I want to extend gratitude to our public officials. Um, also want to extend gratitude to the community organizations. I was locked up for 15 years. Um, in his community. We sold narcotics through the 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, I went to prison for a homicide. My friend went to prison for drug trade. When I got out, three weeks after I got out, Alea Harvey Quinn was doing a community violence conference. They broke in my car, tore my car up. I came out discouraged, kind of. All these community organizations went in their pocket, gave me money to get my car fixed. I knew these were the people I should be with. Since then, I started getting educated, trained, and informed on community violence intervention. We practice a model that uh, relies on the credible messenger, the person who has pre-existing relationships in community to leverage those pre-existing relationships, to develop new relationships, to curve, discourage and combat gun violence. What does that look like? Real case scenario that happened um, within the last 30 to 60 days. Individuals, and it's people in here that can attest to it. Individuals had a high profile shootout. They blasted it all over a social media platform. Through that social media platform, Everybody was in the comments and it was causing more conflict. What did we do? The relationships that we had with individuals that we build with the youth, that we build with community, that we build with their families, we did consistent engagement, consistent outreach, telling them to stop communicating on that. We used something that we call consequential thinking with a little spidget of focused deterrent. You should stop doing that because it's people on this site watching you and you're gonna ruin your life. That brought us time to be able to de-escalate the conflict and really go over the matter. And once both of the sides realized what it was over, they made a decision that it wasn't worth it. That leads me to the next thing. We believe in transformation. 
That's what we believe in. We believe in humanity. We believe in the proof of transformation because I am one of the proofs. It is proof in here. Raphael is one of the proof. We believe in that. We believe in our people. We believe in our people. What is our method? What is our plan? Our plan is to go into our community. Every youth, any person that's a high-risk community member, we do an outreach to them, directly to them. Any organization that wants to partner and is uh, willing to follow a protocol and not just freestyle, we're going to partner with them. Another uh, uh, scenario, we get a call from ceasefire. Ceasefire says, I'm laying in my bed. Ceasefire says, there's been a homicide in your neighborhood. I show up in the neighborhood, we use protocol. Instead of getting out, because I know community, I know our youth don't understand certain things. So trying to have it our way, it does not work like that. You have to communicate with them how they understand. So I let them know I can't get out the car until I figure out whether or not I know somebody out here. Because it's trust with us, it's relation, it's trust. Once we figured out what that was, we allowed them to run primary and we ran secondary and victim support. When it comes to one of our strongest partner and allies, Detroit friends and family, we developed a model, cross neighborhood work. What does cross neighborhood work look like? Consistently sharing information to de-escalate, combat, and resolve conflict. And resolve conflict. We have issues that went on in the city where some organizations get deemed to be uh, uh, compromise when it comes to working in, with law enforcement. So we're developing partnerships right now with organizations to operate as liaisons because we big on trust. We come from a community that's been destroyed. They destroyed every movement. So we had to develop trust back in our community. Uh, when it comes to therapy, somebody got to trust you. They got to feel safe with you to change. How do we do this? With our VIs, that's violence intervention practitioners, we do consistent engagement. We use the theory, Maslow's hierarchy. The first thing we want to know is the basic needs, food, shelter, clothing. Do you have that? Because we know the social determinants of health contribute to the violence. We know that just as well as any other educated person knows that, right? Then what's next? Safety. When it comes to that safety and that pillar, employment is in there too. How can you feel like, how can you feel safe if you know you're about to get kicked out your home? You will go rob somebody. How can you feel safe if everything around you is abandoned, even the schools? How can you feel like that? I know that because I was a young man, a boy that felt like that, whose father fell victim to the crack epidemic. And no man came to save me because they was all too busy working. It was no lane for this. But now it's the lane, it's men and women to come and say, what's next? Belonging to, what do they belong to? They belong to the things that belong to them. And it's a lot of things in this community that don't belong to them. It's a lot of businesses that don't belong to them. It's a lot of education that don't belong to them. And after that, you have self-esteem and self-actualization. We believe that we can accomplish this through CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Figure out what you want to be, and let's practice on uh, delayed gratification, opposed to instant gratification, because everything in society has been developed to feed somebody's instinctual behavior. And I'm going to leave with this. If you think the pandemic didn't change human behavior, you are blind. So me and my partners, as well as the individual groups in the community, Brothers United, we have developed a post-pandemic cross-neighborhood model where we engage with any organization that's really going to be 
invested in consistent engagement with high risk community members. Another thing that we do as part of our strategy is we understand there's three things going on. You have domestic violence. So if anybody in this community, and this is a neighborhood I grew up in, my family been over here since 75. If anybody in this community in a black club, black clubs get with us so we can teach you our de-escalation tactics, so we can teach you our courtesy, how to say hello to your neighbor. When it comes to our children, we are in partnership with Black Bottom Gun Club, getting gun locks, passing them out to community because we know children have been getting hold of firearms, killing themselves. So it's three things we're focused on. We are focused on our children accidentally killing each other, domestic violence between people in the same home and neighbors, and individual and group violence from petty arguments on social media. Uh, I want to stand gratitude to everybody in this community. Um, I don't want to get long-winded because everybody know I get like that, but it is a new period in human history. The pandemic was real. They had our children on uh, uh, Zoom for two years. That did something to them psychologically. And it takes somebody to really, really, really consider that and come with the method that addresses what's going on now. The problem ain't just in the streets. The problem is on social media. And we're going to engage through social media. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. And as you can see, why this works. I know that it works, and for the community, this is how you get in contact with them. We'll make sure that it's posted on the website because it's gonna take all of us. And so at this point, I'll turn it back over to the mayor, but I do wanna just, once again, um, just really thank Chief White and the whole DPD executive leadership team because some will ask, is the chief in, bought into this? Absolutely. Matter of fact, at Zeke's press conference, he made the statement that only in the city of Detroit can he pick up the phone and call the chief of police, call the mayor's office, where grassroots community activists have this type of relationship because we all have one common goal. We have different swim lanes, but the goal is to re reduce the level of violence in our city. So, Mr. Mayor. All right. All right. So you see why I'm enthusiastic about what we've got? Were they impressive? Yep. Uh, so we're going to see. Uh, we're now going to go to questions. We were posted from 7 to 8.30, but we've talked for a while. We're going to go to 9 o'clock uh, to get the questions in. One last thing before we start, and we have people, uh, where are our folks with the microphones? Folks on each aisle will take one from inside the church, one from Zoom will alternate. It'll be limited to 60 seconds. We want to get to everybody. Before we do, though, one last point of privilege. I want Representative Stephanie Young to stand up one more time. She, uh, she does not represent this district, but next week she's about to become the most important person in the city of Detroit because she is going to introduce the bill in Michigan for the land value tax that's going to cut taxes for uh, property owners across the city by hundreds of dollars with the backing of Speaker Joe Tate. It's been a long time coming, uh, and we'll be kicking it off on Thursday. But, Representative, thank you very much. Uh, you're going to be popular in this neighborhood, too. Oh, you do represent this district? Half of the district. All right. I know her from Rosedale. All right. Okay, uh, with that, um, so we have Mother Bernice, and I'm going to give her a point of privilege here to ask the first question off my microphone, although usually she's mad at me about something, so I may regret this. Not tonight. Good evening, everyone. All right, 300, you forgot one thing. There were women in the organization. All right. Why? Why in the world did you forget us? 
I happened to be one of them. And there were about 10 of us. I can tell you when our first case started, when there was a senior woman that was raped over on Dexter, and uh, I think it was uh, whatever it was. Anyway, over there on Dexter, we all gathered right there at Dexter, over 10 of us in cars. And we went over there after we found out it was a street after uh, Dexter, I think, well, whatever it was. Uh, you know, I don't have to tell you. Anyway, I just want the public to know we were involved with the 300 also. I happened to be one of them. There was three members. Not only did we help in the crime, we did a lot of walking also. It was, uh, what's his name? Uh, he's deceased now. What's his name? Henderson. Henderson. Thanks, baby. Henderson. And then we had uh, uh, in the hospital. Malik. What? Malik. Malik. You know. Malik. And you. I'm 91, y'all, so I got to remember. I can't think of everything. Yeah. The, Lord, the good Lord has kept me this long on earth so I can continue my talking to the public and to my dear mayor. And I have one suggestion that I want to tell you. I want the people of this city to know we can do better than what we're doing in this city. We all love this city. I know I do. I've been here 64 years, so you know I love it. I came from Chicago, and you know what they was doing over there. But anyway, let me tell you one thing, and I'm going to shut up. Everybody that lives in the city of Detroit, you should find you an officer, I mean a police officer that you can trust and you can talk to and tell him what's on your mind and what the crime is all about in this city. Don't be afraid. You got a DOP. You can talk to him. I have one. I have a commander that I talk to. So I'm telling all of you, don't be scared. If you know some crime going on, go get you a policeman that you can talk to. He'll take care of it. Don't go to the station. You can go to the police that you know and you can trust. I'm telling you, because it happens. It happened to me, and I got someone that I can talk to. Matter of fact, I even call the mayor and tell him things, too. But the fact is, I'm going to shut up because the mayor is standing here. But remember, this is our city. Our city. We got a damn good police department. I love them. And I'm glad that you gave them a raise. But anyway, I go to my police meetings, and I will tell about this meeting. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. I love you, baby. Love you. Uh, and I don't think he would mind me reporting, but I visited Malik Shabazz in the hospital last week. He is doing great. Looking forward uh, to being released and on his way to, to rehab. Uh, and he definitely feels the spirit of this city uh, behind him, but it was tremendous to see. Okay, do we have a question inside the, from either side? Uh, Carla, go ahead. Tell us your name and where you live. My name is Marilyn Winfrey from the Northwest Community Block Club Association. And I just want to say thank you to the mayor for all that he did during the pandemic to get us through. And I want to thank the city council, Councilman Durr Hall, uh, I just so many people that we have built relationships with. And we're not one of the big dogs, but we're little puppies with a big voice. <laughs> and I want to say thank you to New Era. When I looked at your map, it looks like we're not going to be overlooked this time, but I'm not sure. I need to have that address again so I can visit your hub. And Mayor, we, have, we don't have a lot of gun violence, but we do have two major issues. And since I only have 60 minutes, I actually printed out <laughs> what I want you to do for me, and I will give it to someone, and I will definitely expect to okay. hear from you. But tell, tell us the highlights. Okay, illegal dumping and safety. Okay. We're one of, the highest, one of the highest prostitution areas on the west side. We were fortunate enough for the big thing that happened a few weeks ago. And these ladies are not all bad women. They are women who have issues. And I have been in touch with the second precinct, and they are working very hard with us to try to figure out what we can do. But I think the community and other entities need to get involved. Because in, I did some research, and in Ohio, they're working with churches to have safe havens where these ladies can come in and not be judged. 
and they give them different things or whatever. So I think in the city of Detroit, we need to do something. In fact, I'm wearing a short haircut now, and I was on my way to my Block Club's um, book, ba book bag event on Saturday, and I got flashed. I mean, she showed me all her boobs. So I turned around and I quoted John 3.16 to her, <laughs> and I told her, God has a better plan for your life. And I want to give kudos to the second precinct and Mr. Ricardo Moore and Mr. Drew Hall's staff and everyone. They had, we had a situation where What's the that? prostitutes was using, we had a situation I'm where sorry. they bought land bank property and they were storing items on there. And we had been working on it almost a year and a half, but I don't know if the time is right or what, but I want to say thank you because as of tonight, everything's been cleaned up. All right. <laughs> We're glad to hear it. All right, let's take a caller on the phone. Tell us your name and where you live. Who have we got? Pastor Alonzo Bell. Okay, you, Pastor. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Hey, how you doing, Mayor Duggan? And, and, and to our great city council, we want to thank God for what you're doing with this uh, uh, violence prevention program. And uh, I want to give a big shout out to all of the groups who've uh, been able to take advantage of their know-how and their expertise being in the streets. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I've been working with young moms for the last five years, and I've been providing uh, resources. And I'm telling you, they are a network that we can use to get to those who may be involved in violence. It's been many times where I've talked to some of the young ladies in my program, and they've told me about some of the things that that happen as far as violence and uh, retaliation. And I've been able to talk to them, to their brothers, to their uh, the fathers of their children uh, and other people in their family and get directly uh, with those guys and, and resolve conflict. And so I have a, a, a number of uh, commercial properties that I can use to help uh, any group that wants to use my properties, use my church. Uh, I have a music studio, I got a podcast studio. Uh, we teach skill trades, we got job placement, we got all these different resources. And so I just want to offer that up to any group that wants to work together. I thank God for Niggas Vu, Zeke, and Ray Winans, and Demi Neighborhood Alliance, and all of those guys, all of you, Detroit 300, that's still on the uh, battlefield. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, let's take one on this side. Tell us your name and where you live. Good afternoon. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor Duggan. Zsa, Zsa Hubbard here. What up, though, y'all? <laughs> I was about to say we in Detroit. We say, what up, though? So my question to you is, I work with Forest Detroit, and I would like to know how can we provide some incentives for those individuals that are providing uh, or decreasing the community violence? Like, can we give them a spirit of Detroit Award? Can we have a highlight or maybe some city stars where we can highlight those individuals that are doing those great work? I, I think that's a great idea. Uh, Council Member Coleman Young is disappointed <laughs> that he's not here with the Spirit of Detroit Award uh, tonight. Uh, but I think the recognition, of course, is financial incentives, but I, I, most the folks who are doing this aren't doing it for the money. Right. right. They're doing it because in their heart they want to change things. And I think that's a great idea. Let's talk and let's find a way to recognize them appropriately. Awesome. And then also we are having a meet and greet on September 30th where we're asking all of our block club community leaders and those individuals in District 7 if they would like to attend. So that way our community can get to know our faces and have better uh, personal relationships with all of those community leaders. So if you're interested in joining us, we would love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, somebody from home, who do we have? Pass property tax, you can unmute yourself, you have 60 seconds. Good evening, Mayor, good evening, Council and Good public. evening. Uh, Mayor, I talked to you last, year, last uh, time you had a public meeting and you promised to pass the property tax reform ordinance. As you know, we've been overtaxed $600 million 100,000 homes were illegally foreclosed. These are illegal taxations and we need to be made whole right now before the next assessment. It causes crime, it causes blight, and we don't want you to fight uh, with, uh, with the council any longer. Therefore, the property tax ordinance, when can you have it passed? We need it before the next assessment because they're all illegal assessments and we're trying to keep people in their homes to stop this blight and to stop these crimes. 
it causes mental illness. And you made us a promise that you'll pass it and it hasn't been passed. We want to know when is it going to be passed and do it right away. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, I, I think city council probably could give you a better answer on when they're going to act on an ordinance. I know they've been working uh, with the uh, treasurer and they expect, uh, council members here are saying they expect to take it up this fall. Uh, okay, who's next? Tell us your name and where you live. How you doing? This is Brother Cunningham. I'm in the uh, Linwood area right now. I'm going to talk about um, the urgency. Again, last time I talked about the urgency with Detroit Department of Transportation, uh, the, the bus driver shortage. Um, it's, it's people, I have a taxi cab service. Uh, it's my side hustle to my disability. And uh, I get an earful. People have seen me at city council meetings or at DDOT meetings or whatever, and they, I tell them, no, you call, call them directly. Here's your council member's number. Here's your, the mayor's office, et cetera. And people are, let's put a face to these, these moms, sons, daughters, neighbors. The bus service is, is on time ratio is like 61%. That's like a D. Or 61 to 70%, that's horrible. Um, and it needs to change with urgency. You, you mentioned the police. You went and gave them 10 grand. Um, and you got in there and got your feet dirty. Um, you've done a great job when Dan Dirks was around, you got the new buses and all that thing. The creativity and urgency is what I'm asking for, creativity and urgency. And if I could speak to Mr. Staley or Barkley, I have a couple questions about some bus stops that okay. are missing uh, in the community. Is Michael Staley here? Uh, Michael, stand up. You go talk to Brother Cunningham. You will find he is your most active uh, rider, and when you're doing well, your most active supporter. Uh, and I agree with everything that you've said. We are getting aggressive. We are getting creative. Here's what we're doing. Uh, last year, uh, I went, well, two years ago, we had a new contract with the drivers, $2 an hour pay raise, drivers ratified it. We found a big part of our problem was we had high absenteeism, which was causing buses not to go on the road. Last year, I reopened the contract four years earlier. I said, I'll give you a $4,000 raise on one condition. You got to come to work. And we signed an agreement that they get an extra $1,000 every quarter if they regularly attend work. 70% of the drivers are earning that $4,000, an extra two bucks an hour. That's let us get a little bit of an increase. But we needed to do more, and we were not succeeding in our recruitment. We were paying people starting out in the training academy $14.70 an hour. We just raised it in June to $16.20 an hour. And we explained to the folks coming in that once you pass the academy class, if you show up to work, you go up to $18.20 an hour with benefits. And you know what's happened? This month, for the first time, we filled the academy, 44 people in the training session this month. Another 40, it looks like we're going to have next month. So today, we have 130 drivers down on the street. We've got 77 in the academy. We'll have 40 more in the academy in September. Uh, and Michael Staley, uh, he took over the most screwed up operation in city government, the paratransit operation, in January, right? Uh, and you want to talk about bad on-time performance, our seniors and disabled wouldn't get picked up. At times they got dropped off at the wrong places. He took that over. You can go on the website now. 95% on-time performance this year. And I said, if you can do that for paratransit, it's time you take over the whole system. And so what I've said to him is this. We are putting 135 buses on the street today. We had 200 before the pandemic. We got 135. I said, by January, I want to see 155. By April, 175. By September, 195. And by the end of the next year, full bus service. Uh, and if he succeeds at that, the way he succeeded at paratransit, you're actually going to be happy with me uh, sometime next year. But I'm going to have uh, Michael Staley introduce himself to you, because I'm sure your suggestions on the bus stops are good ones, as they always are. So thank you for staying so uh, vigilant with me, and I'm going to get this fixed. There you go. All right. Let's take somebody. Thank you very much. Let's take somebody at home. Ms. Betty Varner, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Good 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Betty A. Varner, president of DeSoto Ellsworth Black Association. Good evening. And uh, I want to say thank you to Mayor Duggan for the work he is doing for our wonderful city, especially in the neighborhoods. I mean, he is really getting in the hood and getting the work done. I want to um, say thank you to all of the council members, especially my honorable council member, uh, Durhall for all the assistance that they have provided to my black club. And I want to say I'm happy, happy, happy that uh, my Finkel corridor from Finkel in Illinois to Finkel in Wyoming is going to be part of the improvement that is. is happening in the neighborhoods. And I also want to say thank you, Mayor. I had a great time uh, at your home last week. Thank you and Mrs. Duggan. The food was delicious, the music <laughs> was popping, the weather was good. The only issue I had, I was fighting the bees, but I had a wonderful time, great conversation, and I appreciate you. All and right. I'm happy, well, happy, happy. Thank you. All right, sometimes people are happy. Go ahead, who's next? Tell us your name and where you live. Oh, my name is Calvin Colbert. I'm a community resident and stakeholder as the executive director of Detroit Impact. I'm here tonight also representing Brothers on Patrol, a community organization that has had boots on the ground in this community for a number of years, and also my co-founding partner, Bernard Spragner, who is now deceased. But his spirit is alive and well tonight of what I've heard on that platform. Raphael Johnson, thank you for the plan that you have laid out tonight about what's going to take place in the 227 community. My question tonight, Brothers on Patrol emphasis was safe routes to school, making sure that our students had a safe journey to and from school. As I heard about the 24-hour patrols and availability of uh, volunteers, is there an emphasis being placed on the school and the children going to and from school. Detroit Impact stands here tonight making ourselves a part of this initiative. We have a program called Shoot With Cameras, Not With Guns, teaching the value of life through the eye of a camera. We want to engage with this opportunity to make our community a safer place for all of us to live with a better quality of life. So I thank the mayor tonight. I thank Dua Hall tonight for having this availability to have a conversation. But more than that, let's have a plan and that all of us can be a part of. Thank you. No, thank you. And thank you for your service as well. We appreciate you. You are stalwart in our community. Uh, to answer your question directly, we are working directly with all the schools in our district. We have a, um, a building that we have leased. It's at, I don't know the address by heart, 15920 Grand River Avenue. We will be having an uh, opening uh, for that particular building, and we're inviting our principals who are in that area so that they'll know that we are in that area to patrol, again, 24 hours a day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Let's take somebody from home. Ms. Cicely McLellan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, good evening. Um, uh, my name is Cicely McLellan. I'm the vice president of, of uh, Detroit um, Active and Retired, Retiree Association. And I'm calling because I want it to be known that the retirees uh, are, in, are really suffering at this point in time due to the bankruptcy. It's been 10 years now, and many of us uh, are experiencing great pain due to the clawback. That clawback is 15.5% of um, our income. And, you know, uh, as I indicated, it's been 10 years, and it's the amount that was uh, agreed upon to be removed from my pension, it's the same amount because what was done is that they added on a 6.75 interest uh, to that uh, amount that they took from all retirees. And so now that interest rate is like a, a mortgage on your home. You end up paying twice as much or three times as much. We need some uh, uh, remedy. We need some uh, 
relief. You know, it's our understanding that uh, the state has allocated 25 million to the city of Detroit that can be used uh, uh, for pensions. Uh, we would like to see maybe there is some type of stipend that could be considered for the retirees. The retirees are the seniors of, of Detroit. I mean, they're the, the anchors of our in our community. And to live continuously and not have a cost of living allowance, to have 4.5% taken from your pension, you're, we're living and getting poorer as we get older. And that okay. So, I. Uh I, one of the very best things I think council did was over the last 10 years, you all heard about Pension Cliff. 2024, Detroit was going to go uh, back into bankruptcy, wasn't going to be able to make its pension payments because Kevin Orr's plan of adjustment said we didn't make any pension payments for 10 years and then we had to pay $140 million. Council set aside more than $400 million in the last decade to make sure that our retirees would not have to face another cut, one that everybody predicted. We just wrote our first check for $140 million to keep that pension system uh, whole. We are going to evaluate in next year's budget. We're having conversations now with council that will be sending up in February. The state money, enhancement money, the state sends you pension money, but they condition it on you can't raise benefits. The state money is to fill holes in the pension. But we are looking at ways to try to do some type of enhancement next year. I know council's interested, uh, and uh, uh, in February I'll be making a proposal that probably retirees won't think is enough, but is certainly a lot more than has been done in a long time. Uh, thank you. All right, which I lost track. Over on this side. Go ahead, tell us your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Carol Baker. I'm from the Far West neighborhood. And um, I appreciate you, what you've done, Mayor, to help the city and also the council. Um, I'm here because I have a concern about um, the Rouge Park um, working that you're doing over there. And no one has really came out to tell us what's going on. You know, the streets are torn up here, there. Every day you don't know which way you're going to go because some of the main streets are torn out. And I'd like to know what is going on, who's doing the planning. Gary, is this you? Why haven't no one contacted us right. as to why okay. and okay. what is going okay, on? Okay, so I'm take, I assume from the fact that Gary Brown stood up that he did it. Uh, so uh, let's have our water and sewer director tell everybody what's going on, what's the plan? Yeah, I mean, there was an unprecedented amount of community input into what's going into what we call the Far West Project. And we're completely separating 1,200 homes from the sewer system so that you'll never experience flooding. And all the remodeling at Rouge was all planned by the 1,200 residents in that neighborhood. So I'll be more than happy to come over and, and share with you uh, some of the other details. So here's what they're doing in simple terms. That huge excavation project the stormwater is going to run into that Rouge Basin and then into the river. But when they separate your sewer system, the next time there's a flood, none of your homes will back up into the basement because you're no longer on a combined system. So what they're trying to do is demonstrate how we can start a neighborhood at a time doing this. So I know there have been lots of meetings. I've been out there with neighbors, uh, but I think this is going to turn out uh, very well, and I think it's going to be a beautiful addition to Rouge Park uh, when you see the uh, uh, the water amenity running through there. Uh, okay, somebody from home. Miss Patty Fedwa, you can go ahead and mute yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for having this meeting. Um, last year I was at one of these, by the way, I'm a bus rider, Detroit resident, um, and last year you said that, yep, we're going get, to gonna get drivers going, it's going to be better out there, everything's going to be working, and, and it's not. I mean, it, the whole last 10 years we still haven't had enough drivers to m make DDOT anything less than an option of last resort. 
we need something better. We need what you know, the Detroiters, who, all of us have put in our, our thoughts and our, our prayers and everything else to make Detroit imagined. We need that to be the case. We need to multiply what we have by so much. And we can't, in, even though you're in charge, you have control, still don't even pay the drivers enough. You can decide that tomorrow. The drivers union will be there. We need this taken care of now. You know what to do, and we just need to do it. Thank you. Okay, so I mean, you may not have heard it earlier, uh, but I talked about the fact we raised the starting pay a dollar and a half. We got 77 people in the academy. We expect to have 40 more drivers in the academy in September, uh, and I do expect us uh, to be fully staffed in January. But there's a lot more problems at DDOT uh, than driver pay. We've got safety issues, we've got cleanliness issues, we've got on-time performance issues. Uh, and for anybody who experienced our elderly disabled service and what Michael Staley has done with that in the last year, uh, I'm expecting a completely different level of performance uh, from DDOT as the, our new drivers leave, leave the academy and start to be back out on the streets uh, later this year. Okay, uh, over on, I'm sorry, this side. Okay, um, my question is, we talk about um, do, what we're doing. There was a billion dollars stolen from the city of Detroit and generational wealth. We're talking about the taxation, we're talking about the land tax. I, I'm all in agreement with the land tax, okay? But the thing about it is, when we do this land tax, Ms. Young, we don't want to grandfather anyone in. They got to pay their bills. Their bills are coming due in three years. We need them to pay their bills. Another thing, when you go get these CBI groups, did you come and get the groups that were on the grounds already doing it? Calvin Cartwright, Brothers on Patrol, they have been doing this in the Cody Rouge area, which you stand in for I don't know how many years with the Brothers on Patrol safe routes to school. These, these things that you're saying, in this area, 48228, we don't have no CBI. We, we're one of the deadliest districts with no recreation, no nothing for the kids in this community, no, no development, no nothing in here. What I'm asking you is we're giving these, these groups, we're giving people uh, money, but what we're not doing is making sure that the residents are securely in their homes. When we start giving okay. groups money, uh, we can so, turn around and make sure so. our residents let me, let, me, let me see if I can address these in the order that they were done. One is, we had numerous public meetings for every activist group in the city. 25 groups came together and put in proposals. Everybody uh, had the opportunity. And as far as this area, uh, Councilmember Durhall has talked about the fact that we have not had options for our young people for a long time. I went to the Detroit Pistons and said, we have a spectacular uh, summer uh, uh, pool here at Brennan Pool that doesn't get used the rest of the year. And the Pistons are putting $20 million into building out a new rec center at the Brennan Pool site uh, for the folks in this district. So you have a council member who's watching out, you've got uh, uh, companies like the Pistons that are watching out, and we're just gonna keep working uh, until we get the kind of city that we want in every corner. Uh, let's take somebody from home. Mr. Larry Verse, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and others. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to start this and I hope you don't cut me off. But I have a question at the end. I once described you as a person who not only has a forked tongue, but has a tongue that is forked on both ends and swivels out the middle so you can lie out of both sides of your mouth at the same time. I'd like to know if I'm right or not. My question is, do you support a minimum starting wage, not a training wage, but a starting wage as much for a bus driver of $23 an hour? And I reserve the rest of my time for possible response. Yeah. So I, I support sitting down with the union and working something out 
that works for everybody. Uh, and as I said, we did a $2 an hour raise in 21. I reopened it in 22 and did another $2 an hour raise for the folks who were showing up. Uh, and we have now raised it sufficiently uh, that uh, we've got 77 people in the training academy and 40 more coming uh, next month. So we're going to keep going till we have the qu kind of bus service. I know people have got these ideas, but this is the reason we do these meetings. We give you information. The driver academies are filling. We are going to have more buses on the street. Uh, Carla, who you got on your side? Good evening. Thank you. My name is Martin Gonzalez. I'm a longtime resident on this street. In fact, over 50 years. In the last year, one individual has set fire to a garage and who lives right behind the shot spotter, shot spotter, has laid siege to one, two, three, two, six properties. Now, two vehicles have been, one's in Washington, D.C., one has been disposed of. The police have not investigated it. No one has been there to collect evidence. That's happened in April. I'll reserve 30 seconds. Sir, uh, Chief White, uh, D.C. Stewart is in charge of the West Side. She will get your information. We can follow up. I don't know enough about the information to talk intelligently about it, but we'll follow up and, and find out what's going on. So my, my reserve is why can't citizens enter into the 8th Precinct without a reservation and without being browbeat? Well, you should be able to. The precincts are open 24-7, and uh, I will look into that. You should be able to walk into any precinct seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Okay. Let's take somebody from home. Monroe Snyder, you can go ahead and mute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the work that's being done by all of the groups that's there, but I'm a long-time Detroiter. I started a pre-primary in 1946, and other than seven years that I spent in New York uh, doing a school and what have you and training, I lived in Detroit and always had residents in Detroit, always voted in Detroit. But my concern is this open a free hand that we are giving to these cannabis dealers. They are putting big, huge, bold billboards all over the city. And that is to entice young people because they know that the ones that's already using it will be there. Now, what's being done to regulate them? They should be regulated and they should not have these big signs all over the city. It's uh, very dangerous and it's enticing young people to start using this stuff and they will not progress anywhere if they are being using dope while they're trying to study in school. So what's being done about this? So one of the realities is that we live in a democracy and the people of this state uh, got a chance to decide whether to legalize marijuana. Uh, they passed it overwhelmingly. People in Detroit voted 77% to do it. So it's my responsibility to honor the votes of the people of the state and the people of the city. Uh, and I'm sorry that you're in the other 25 percent, but uh, this is what uh, the voters decided. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Good Mayor. Evening. My name is Shirley. I am a retiree as well, 2012 Employment and Training. Something that you've said in the last five minutes has been refreshing. In fact, this meeting that has been held this evening with all of the cooperation, all of the stakeholders coming together has been wonderful. My ask is simple. We stood with you three terms ago in the write-in campaign to get you on because we believed in you. And now the ask is, Bring us aboard, bring some of us retirees aboard to help to craft a solution. We have met, uh, spoken with Council Durhall. He has been wonderful. Uh, also the council president. But we need you, sir, to really get behind creating something for us, because we're hurting. Over 1,000 of us have passed away since the pandemic. So we, we have a brain trust. You know, these gray hairs can bring some ideas to the table, and we would love 
to sit down and explore what can be done, sir. So t tell me your name again. It's Shirley. Shirley Manis. Okay, Ms. Manis, you are now the chair of the Retiree Advisory Committee. <laughs> Steve, Steve Watson, stand up. So Steve, sir, we, we hang on. we have our longtime a uh, person here, Bill Davis, yeah. has, who okay. has been the advocate okay. for us, yes. Cecily, uh, and, and I, get, I would I, certainly be, I, I would okay. love to be a part okay. of you, well, you'll this be, man you'll, has you'll, been. You'll, you'll, be a, you'll be a part of it. Steve Watson is the budget director. One of his primary jobs right now is to look at next year's budget and to figure out options, too, for the retirees, but the active employees had their pension cuts pensions cut too and so we need to do something to enhance the pensions for the active employees we need to do something for the retirees the one thing i'm sure of is everybody will think it's not enough but we are going to work hard at it and if you'd like to be a part of that conversation i'd love for you to be a part of it we would love to be okay. at the table all right you're, you're you're in so steve would you make sure you get Ms. Madison's name and number all right let's take somebody from home Roger Webb, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You have 60 seconds. What up, though, Detroit? I'm a DDOT operator, Mr. Mayor. I think you're familiar with me. Um, first, I want to know what happened to the hazard pay. What happened to the hazard pay money? The hazard pay money just went away. There's a lot of funds that come into the city of Detroit uh, under the name of transportation. And I personally feel like you discipline us every chance you get. You know, you got money to increase our wages, but yet you haven't increased our wages. You want to negotiate something, but we're being underpaid. We understaffed for that reason, for that reason alone. I got six years in with the city. I come to work every day. Everybody that work with me come to work every day. Something needs to be done about it. Uh, you say you increase start and pay. I don't know nothing about it, so I mean, I need to find out for myself, but I hear you, but I don't see it. Uh, and so let's talk about hazard pay for a second. Hazard pay came from the federal government when uh, COVID was raging. Police department got hazard pay. Firefighters got hazard pay. Bus drivers got hazard pay. EMTs got hazard pay. When the COVID a uh, crisis abated, the feds stopped sending hazard pay. And so uh, DDOT got hazard pay. DDOT drivers did a great job during the pandemic. They got the hazard pay the same time the police, the fire, and the EMTs did. Uh, and that's what happened to it. But again, I, I'm happy to sit down and talk to anybody, but all you got to do is go to the city website. You will see the starting wage has been raised from $14.70 to an hour uh, to something like $16.20 an hour, which is how we're filling up our classes. Uh, Mr. Webb, on this please, side now? please accept your invitation. Good afternoon yes. to all of my citizens here in Detroit. I am G Jennifer Williams. I don't want to uh, stumble over this, but I just want to, I want to compliment and I don't want to complain. Mike Duggan, I couldn't have did this world without you. I am a mother of a murdered child. 11-year-old took an AK, gave it to a 15-year-old, and murdered my grandson. 3.5 cast tech. He had scholarships to college for academic and athletic. At that time, I've always been an advocate for Detroit. I love Detroit. I'm Detroit's finest, okay? But I lost, I lost the best guy in the world that God had blessed me with when they took Pierre home. The last time I was in this church, there was a funeral for a guy that she got shot five times. So I just want to say to the mayor, Mike Duggan, to the deputy mayor is when I met Ty Bettison when Pierre got murdered, and he's been my friend, he's been my confidant ever since. When I can't handle those nights, I text Mr. Bettison and I ask him to pray for me. And guess what? He calls me back and pray for me right then. I also asked the mayor, he came out, about the slum landlords. I bought up a bunch of property. I know I'm taking a minute. Give me one thing, please. You're, but, you're an inspiration to all of us, Ms. Williams. Go ahead. So the mayor came out, and he physically drew, drove me around to the areas where I had bought homes. I bought the homes. I'm dying of cancer. I'm going to give them to the kids. Kids say, no, I become a landlord. So I've had so kind of problems. Oh, I don't even know what to tell you. My grandson came 
June 9th put a gun to my head and tried to rob me. They have not paid rent in, two, in almost two years in my house. But let's get back to this. The mayor came, he took me to my properties, and he said, you're not a slum landlord, Ms. Jennifer. Do what you're doing. I got your back. So whenever his mother came, we seen it, we tried to do a lot. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, I have had so much help in the eight years that Pierre has been murdered, okay? And I want to call out everybody who has come out to let me know that I stayed in this city to make a difference, and I really have. I just want you to know, Mr. Mayor, I got an illegal grow house shut down uh, Friday. Uh, I want you to know, Mayor, Across uh, next from the legal grow house, they doing illegal trafficking. Your inspectors came out and told them if they didn't have that mess out of there in a week, guess what? Everything is gone. So one voice does matter. Does matter. God bless America. God bless America. Oh. Ms. Ms. Williams, you've been watching out for every child and grandchild in the city. God bless you. All right, uh, let's take somebody from home. Ms. Belinda Lee, you can go in and unmute, unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I was um, trying to ask a question, basically. Um, when we sit our lawn um, waste out by the curb and it happens to rain consecutively and the bags get wet, when they come and pick up the um, bags, the bag grips, they keep, they throw the bag in the back of the truck and then leave the waste on the curb. And it's been out um, on our street for at least two weeks. What is the process and do okay. they carry brooms and shovels to okay. clean up the mess, just to put it in the back of the truck? They, for sure they, to, for sure they should be. Too. I wanna take your, I want, I want you I'm offline and we're gonna ask you for your address and we're gonna get somebody out there tomorrow. We will get them to clean it up. They should have a shovel uh, and they should be cleaning it up when that happens. But I want to get somebody out there tomorrow. Okay, so just give us your, your address. Ms. Okay. Lee, please accept your invitation. Yes, hello, Mr. Mayor. My name is D'Amico Williams. I am the Chief Executive Director of Hydrate Detroit. We deliver water. We provide advocacy, consultation, and restoration of people's water bills to Detroit residents and citizens living with their water shut off. My simple question that I have for you, Mr. Mayor, the CEO of the city, is when are you going to permanently stop shutting off the water for good. This is a black eye on our city. I have worked with the director, Gary Brown. I've worked with him on the Detroit Water and Sewage Department Lifeline Plan with Wayne Metro. Community organizations have come across to provide some of their uh, strategies and solutions to help people with their water bills, the most low income people and also the working poor. Mr. Mayor, I have not seen you yourself promote the system, promote the program. Many people in the city of Detroit still have no idea what the lifeline plan is. Your director, Wayne Metro and community partners along with the city council have done more than enough to inform the residents. Now we need to see you in action, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so I'll, so I'll answer your question. Uh, so I stopped the water shutoffs in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit for three years. And Governor Whitmer supplied the funding that offset those losses. But I'll ask people here whether you think we should stop shutoffs. Because the politically easy thing is, I'm gonna come back in my next life as a politician that tells everybody what you wanna hear. But here's the truth, that each city is its own fund in water. When somebody in Detroit doesn't pay, the other Detroiters pay. When somebody in Farmington doesn't pay, other people in Farmington pay. We set up the lifeline that Gary Brown, with a lot of the community groups, set up for $18 a month for people below the poverty level, 25,000 homes in this city have signed up for the $18 a month lifeline. If you go around the country, I go to mayor's conferences, the Detroit Lifeline program is talked about as the national model. I think people in this city are willing to help out people who genuinely can't afford to pay. We have started water shutoffs again, and I'll tell you why. I'm doing it because I'm fighting for you. 
Today, you are paying, if you are paying a water bill in Detroit, about $150 a year for people who don't pay. And that's okay if they really can't pay. It's about to go to $300 a year because 30% of this city isn't paying. So the water shutoffs you're hearing me be criticized for, let me tell you the water shutoffs we've done in the last few weeks. In Palmer Woods, we had 30 households that when I announced in 2020 we were suspending shutoffs, stopped paying their water bill. 30 households in Palmer Woods, $5,000 in arrears. We sent them shutoff notices, put up door hangers in Palmer Woods. Nine of them didn't believe me. They didn't think we'd have the nerve. We shut them off. 24 hours later, they called in Indian Village, 35 people with more than a $5,000 water bill. We put the door hangers on and said, you can afford to pay, you have to pay. One of them called up, was so angry, said, I'm not gonna pay unless I get the $18 lifeline. He lived in a 5,000 square foot mansion in Indian Village and was demanding the $18 low income rate. We shut off, at least set notices, to 50 people in Rosedale Park, only 20 in Sherwood Forest. They appear to be a little bit more believing of what we are doing. These folks have to pay their bills, and I don't care how much you make, if you say to people in the city, doesn't matter if you pay, you're gonna keep getting water. Then you, and some people here will remember the days you had 10, 14% annual rate increases on your water. Uh, and so here's the question I have. For all the good people in the city who think the 150 a year they're already paying is a lot and can't afford the 300, I'm fighting for you. I'm going to make sure that the 25,000 families that can't afford it are going to get the $18 rate. I'm also going to make sure the people who can't afford it pay their bills was so not laid on to you. Some people may disagree with that. That's what I'm doing, and that's why. All right, let's take somebody from home. Ms. Olivia Williams, you can go on and unmute yourself. Good evening. Good evening. I am a city of Detroit retiree. I'd like to know what you're going to do to help the retirees this year, not look at something next year to help us. That $6.6 .6 million that went to build a, a shelter and clinic for adults, some of that money could have went to me to help pay my medical costs because I don't have insurance to pay it. Some of that money could have went to pay my property tax. Some of that money could have went to pay my water bill that you're talking about now, because I'm quite sure I don't qualify for that program because you say uh, my little pension money that's cut so much is too much for one person because I don't have any dependents. When can you do something for us now? Not next year, now. We never voted to go into bankruptcy. Bankruptcy was forced on us. Downtown looks real nice with some of my pension money. It looks good. When can you help me now before so, next year? And I'm gonna again Answer say, me, please, maybe Mayor. at some point, uh, there will be a mayor who tells you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you the truth. This city went into bankruptcy six months before I get elected. Okay? I didn't put the city in bankruptcy. And in that bankruptcy, the retirees had a very large committee. And they voted to accept the proposal that was on the table. They voted overwhelmingly to accept it, which basically was lock in for 10 years these payments. And here's what we did. We wrote a check this year for $140 million into that pension fund because this city council had the foresight to set aside the money so that you weren't jeopardized further. Next year, 
we're going to sit down and look at it again. That's just the truth, and uh, I'm hoping now we're going to get some people who are going to sit down and talk to us, hopefully in a reasonable way, uh, that we can try to do something for next year's budget. Uh, which side? Over here? Yes. Tell Hello. us your name my and name. where you live. Hello. My name is Shirley Matthews. I live on Piedmont and Plymouth Road. I have two comments in regards to community violence. As a CVLC member, Community Violence Leadership Council, I advocate for the expansion and improvement of neighborhood safety programs. This includes increased funding for initiatives that focus on conflict resolution, violence prevention, and community engagement. Recognizing the connection between mental health and community violence, we advocate for increased investment in mental health services and support systems. This includes accessible counseling and resources for individuals at risk of involvement in violence. And I'd like you to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, I agree with you 100%, and I think you're going to be very pleased with the job that these groups do. Uh, we're going to get a chance to see for ourselves if they're as effective. Uh, but after hearing them tonight, I'm more optimistic than ever. So thank you. All right, let's take somebody from home. Caller ending 124. You can unmute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Uh, yes, may I be heard? Yes. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Well, it would be nice if the bus drivers could get the same percentage increase as what I heard the mayor got. I heard this year he got a $50,000 raise. I'm not sure if that's okay. accurate, but uh, it's correct. I got, I got to I'm check wrong. my paycheck because I didn't get it. Uh, right. Oh, okay. Well, the bus drivers aren't getting what they deserve because they've got to deal with mental health issues, et cetera. And I waited over an hour during rush hour for the four Woodward bus, so that's not okay. And everybody, please don't fall for this land tax reform switch up proposal. Re proposal. I hear it's going to benefit mostly the people with the skyscrapers who got a big, big building on a smaller piece of land. And watch Charlie Ledef's No BS News Hour show. It's something like keep your tax hiking hands off our freaking houses. A tax special that it'll end up raising prices for everybody. And if you're a renter, don't go for it because the landowner is going to put it on you. And also talking about violence, very interestingly today, there was a company called TriTech going to the Board of Zoning. All right. Uh, so let's be clear on the land value tax. We're going to propose cutting everybody's mills, 12 mills. Uh, homeowners in this city are going to see a 12 mill cut. It'll be 17 to 18 percent. Uh, for homeowners in the city. You'll get a chance to evaluate it and make a decision as to how it works for you. But most people, a 17 to 18 percent property tax cut is a good thing. It actually will put us competitive uh, with Warren and Southfield, uh, Dearborn, and the cities around us who right now have a significantly lower tax rate than we do, as your friends who have moved out there have told you. Uh, okay, question over here. Tell us My your name, name and Jason where you Haskins. live. Um, DWSC has been digging out Majestic since February as part of this Far West Stormwater Project, and now there's been no work for over a month. We've had constant missed deadlines and poor communication. So the question is, when are they actually going to finish paving Majestic, get it finished, and how many more streets are they going to tear up with starting to lay pipe before they finish one? Uh, where's Gary? Okay, Gary, what's going on on the construction project? I, I will find out by tomorrow um, on Majestic. I didn't know there was a problem, but we will be over there tomorrow and make sure that we get you a deadline as to when the project will be finished. Okay. If I can get your number before yeah. you. All right, Gary will follow up on that himself. Thank you. Okay, let's take somebody from home. Ms. Rochella Stewart, you can go ahead and mute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening. Councilwoman. Sheffield and other council members. I'm a person of a resident of District 7, and I'm just concerned with the state of DDOT. Over the last seven years, we've had three directors and interim directors. DDOT is in need of funding to get, to get, to pay up to a decent living wage. I believe the living wage should be starting at least at $23 an hour. We do not provide you need to provide this kind of pay. DDOT will remain not making progress 
on routes, in office, everything. D dot. <laughs> Mayor, you have to make it a priority. Public transportation is what it is, public transportation, and we deserve it as citizens and residents of the city of Detroit. A priority is to get this system up and running efficiently. DDOT is behind a lot of transportation systems throughout this country. I'm begging you. It's no way we're going to keep drivers at $16 an hour. I don't care what you say when Alan Albert is starting them off at at least $18 to $20. Please find the funding. Get this up and running the way it should be. Okay, so I, I, I know sometimes you don't hear things when, when you're at home, but uh, we have 130 shortage of drivers on the road today, 77 in the academy, 40 more coming in September. Uh, and when they do graduate from the academy, they are effectively at 18, 12 an hour uh, with the attendance bonus right out of the gate. Uh, and I do think they should be paid more. But right now, uh, we have successfully filled the academy classes. Uh, and over the next couple months, uh, those drivers will be on the street, and I'm confident uh, that Director Staley is going to significantly improve the service. Okay, which side are we on? Over here? Go ahead. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Joyce, a.k.a. Harriet Tubman of the Hood. And uh, I am just so happy about the CBI initiative. I work with Detroit Force. This is a calling. This is a calling. I'm in the streets three times a week. I'm 75 years old, <laughs> and I'm out there rapping, talking to the young people. And I'm finding that so many young people want to change. And I give honor to Deputy uh, Bettison, to our chief, and the MPOs to treat me real good. And uh, I just have a couple of questions. First of all, I'd like to know if the CBI people can have a meetings to get, uh, you know, maybe every other month to come together and share the, what they're going through and uh, how we all can come together. See, that unity is power. So Zoe, I believe the streets that? already feel that unity. So thank you. And thanks, uh, Councilman Dorhall, because I won the spirit of Detroit to work for gun violence, fun city, not gun city. What's wrong with a little fun? So bless y'all. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um, we're actually in community. Like she said, uh, the CVLC, oh, excuse me. The CVLC is Community Violence Leadership uh, Council. We organized the group because we want to have a group of residents discussing um, the things that they want to see, not just what the youth want to see, right? Everybody in community is a community member, down to the merchant, down to the law enforcement, down to the uh, public. Everybody in community is a community member. So we've already been um, working with that group. Uh, I think it's all of the groups throughout the city. That's what you're trying to say? Yeah. Well, we have had a meeting, um, uh, Detroit 300, Detroit Friends and Family, uh, uh, Wayne, uh, not Wayne Metro. Uh, Denby, uh, Wayne Metro, Denby uh, Alliance, excuse me, I get the names confused, as well as the People's Community. We already had a meeting along with Ceasefire about how we're going to coordinate and uh, share information to address some of the issues uh, in community and do this cross-neighborhood work because violence has no boundaries. It travels with the target. So someone who grew up in our community could have been displaced because they got evicted over the pandemic. Now they live in another community and the things that they engage in hits another community. So we have to stay uh, interconnected when it comes to violence. So we're already in the process of doing that once a month. We had our first uh, meeting, what was that, like two, three weeks ago? Two weeks ago, and we we're working on developing protocol on how we deal with each other because we know we all use different methods, but we hope that these methods could complement each other. All right, thank you. All right, let's take somebody from home. Ms. Rhonda Adams, you can unmute yourself. You have 60 seconds. Okay. 
Hello, Mayor. Uh, Merry Christmas, Adam. So I am really, really glad to see the CBI stepping up and bringing more, uh, you know, awareness of them into the community. But as it goes, a lot of the stakeholders in the community are still uh, looking to see is there any uh, means or accountability that is going to be held uh, from a CBI aspect and to move it. I know you said 25. You they did put in proposals, but for new other um, ways to partnership on a partnership of the uh, level of getting in, everyone involved for those incarcerated individuals that we need to have. That's a part of our community that need to have oversight there as well. Okay, that's a great question. Let's talk about what we're going to do with our returning citizens. One of the things that we're going to do in this particular uh, CVI zone, to answer your question directly, let me go back. Before we even had the opportunity to submit our application and be heard on application, we had to sign paperwork that we will work directly with those individuals who have been just as involved, uh, those who may have some convictions. We had to sign that, that we will work with them, and in our instant case, we're going to be hiring. We actually have 10 slots. 10 slots open for our peacekeepers. And a peacekeeper is an individual that we can pay 18 to $25 an hour to go around and squash beefs. That's all they have to do. They can do it from their porch, they can do it on social media, they can do it in the street. All they have to do is keep the peace and they will get paid between 18 to $25 an hour. That's our objective here in the CVI. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. You taking applications? There you go. All right. Over on this side. Hello. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Charles Cousin. I live off Dexter and Joy. I'm a tech and real estate entrepreneur from New York. I bought a property from the land bank about a year ago with the intention of rehabilitating the community to create a safe space for uh, travelers and, and young brothers who, are, who need jobs. Uh, about two years ago, my, two years ago, about two weeks ago, my door was kicked down by the land bank. They tried to sell back my house that I bought and I live in, and uh, this happened without warning. And uh, yeah, my question is, could you ask them to get off my neck? Because I'm like, I'm trying to do like the right thing. That, that's one of my okay. questions. Well, I'm going to let Tammy Daniels answer well, that not, question, I'm but I've, I'm I've never yet. heard of the I'm land bank. I'm not done yet. Kicking in I still have time. Okay. Huh? So here, Tammy Daniels, land bank director is here. So Tammy, will you respond? So, Mr. Cousins, I'm very familiar with your case. Um, you purchased the house two years ago, and our records indicate that we've reached out to you a number of times to get updates, to get, to get updates, and that we took the house back because we didn't get any. I am more than willing to talk to you now, and you can show me all the improvements that you've made, but that's why the house was taken back. Okay. I don't know about the street. Okay, so the, the process is, is clear, and I've got a lot of neighbors who, when the land bank sells these vacant houses, you, you have to show progress in six to nine months, and you have to document that to the land bank. You have to show them the grass is cut, it's secure, you're doing, and, and if we don't, I want to be, excuse me, if we don't, the neighbors are saying to me, I've got this vacant house, the land bank's all they aren't doing anything with. What are you going to do about it? So for that reason, we require you, in, in the contract you signed, to provide ongoing information. Now, if you've really made significant progress, we want you to keep going. So what Ms. Daniels says is she's going to come out, look at it. If you've got evidence of significant progress, we want you to keep going. If you don't, then what the land bank did is right, and I'm confident she'll treat you fairly. Okay? So, okay, I, I, this is, you, you can talk about other issues you want. If you're not fixing up the property, okay, all right. Okay, all right, let's take somebody from home. Mr. Mayor, this is our final caller of the okay. evening, Mr. All right, Bernard Mazulski. Last caller from home. Please unmute yourself. All right. Um, good evening, Mayor Duggan. Um, thank you for having this forum for the city. Um, just wanted to reach out to you as a resident of District 6 and as a bus rider. I've been in this city since 94, and I remember when DDOT worked well. The thing is, I listen to you, 
you're be getting paid from 16 to 18 dollars an hour were hot wages 10 years ago with inflation being as high as it is because of our federal government we need the pay to be higher at least starting at 23 dollars an hour um, our government, we have the Michigan state governments under democratic control. We have federal government. There is money available for that. You even said that yourself on record. I don't understand why are you still offering these lower wages? Yes, you got 77 drivers coming in, but how long are they going to stay when they realize they're going to collect the revenue? They're going to tell people to follow the ordinances. Uh, um, there might be safety issues on there. All of that for $18 an hour is not going to cut it, Mayor. And I'm going to just be blunt and say you have to raise the wages on that in order to be competitive because I know three DDOT drivers personally. I know their names. They've okay. left DDOT. So uh, there isn't any other way to say this. We were getting about five to eight recruits a month. We've raised the wages, we're running a campaign, and we're showing people that they'll jump from 16 to 18 if they show up for work. And now we've got not five or six a month, we're getting 44 a month entering the academy. And so in other places, people would say to you, we've been waiting a long time for this, 40 a month in the academy. The police department is getting 32 and 33 a month in the academy, and they're celebrating and we're filling our officers. To get 40 in the academy in August, and if we do succeed, as I think we will, another 40 in September, uh, this is what I said I would do, uh, and we're going to get it done. And you can say to me it's not enough. The evidence of, of who's enrolling, I think, is proof. All right, uh, we're done with callers from home and the rest of the folks in the building. Uh, let's go ahead. Happy Monday, everyone. My name is Theo Broughton, co-founder of Hood Research and president of Barton McFarland Neighborhood Association. A young lady earlier talked about the needs of our prostitutes and why they're on the street. Some people have called us and said, why aren't the Johns arrested and their vehicles confiscated? Someone else called and said, well, why don't we have a red light district like they have in New Orleans and Windsor, Canada? Number two, bicycles. I attend the uh, police commission meetings from time to time, otherwise I listen on the phone, and I've not heard a report about crimes with bi involving bicycles. There are people who ride bicycles who commit crimes. There are people who are in accidents, car accidents. I never hear any reports on that. I'd like to hear both. The last thing has to do with the young people, Zoe and, and others, 300, et cetera. They are doing a fine job, but you talk about changing the culture. Please do what you can to get the N-word out of the mouths of the young people who seem to think it's a term of endearment. Please try and tell the young ladies, dress appropriately. They don't have to have skirts up to their waist, and the young men don't have to have the waist of their pants down to the crack of their dirty underwear. <laughs> Good evening, ma'am. Chief White, uh, I'm going to respond to two of your questions. The first regarding uh, us arresting the Johns. We, we have been doing that. We've actually had uh, a much higher degree of success recently, but we could do a better job. Uh, we're going to identify the area that you're talking about. Uh, Deputy Chief, again, will come over and talk to you in a moment. She's here for that very reason. Uh, with regards to the bike accidents, we do study our accident trends and patterns. And unfortunately, Fortunately, uh, our bike riders are relatively safe. We're not having a, an uptick uh, like we see in other cities with the bike accidents. What we are seeing, though, is too much speeding. And so we try to cur curtail the problem by addressing the speeding so they don't get hit and don't get hurt. But we don't see a robbery pattern with the bicycles. All right. Go ahead. Hello, Mayor. Hey. My name is William M. Davis. I'm president among a few groups, but this one I'm mainly talking about, Detroit Active Retired Employee Association. Um, retirees, City Detroit retirees are hurting. They've been hurting, and it's been escalated due to the pandemic. On the average now, 20 City Detroit general fund retirees die per month, each and every month. These numbers wasn't that high when you got elected. You know, so over 1,100 City Detroit retirees have died since right before the pandemic to now. Uh, you, you've been very creative of finding money and doing stuff for a number of people, but yet the group that this whole recovery is built on our backs have received nothing. And, and 
granted, there may have been some stipulations why you couldn't do this or do that, but you could at least cut our property tax, our water bills, uh, and, and the number of services that other people are getting. You know, why do we have to keep dying? Why do you turn a blind eye? Why is it you act like you don't care? So I don't know how anybody could say that we don't care. When the bankruptcy order was entered, they left us with a $140 million cliff in 2024, and people were talking about a separate bankruptcy, which would have been devastating to the retirees. Over the last 10 years, with the support of city council, we took $420 million that we could have used for police, that we could have used for parks, that we could have used for firefighters, we could have used for a lot of services this city badly needed. And we took $420 million that could have gone for those services and put it aside in a retiree protection fund. The rating agencies say they've never seen a city that was so responsible to do that. That was a hard thing for council, was trying to balance budgets on two or three million dollars to set aside 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year because we were not going to let the retirees have to go through this again. Uh, we are in a position now we could write the $140 million check this year. Nobody had their, uh, 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 their payments cut. We didn't have the second bankruptcy. Now we're in a position to talk about what's next. But to say to a city that for 10 years had the discipline to set aside $420 million for our retirees, to say the leadership didn't care, I don't know what your definition is. Some people are more interested in what you say than what you do. But I can tell you here at the city, what we did was set aside money to protect our retirees. Yes. Hello, my name. Hello, my name is Tu. My name is Tawana Morris. Go ahead. And I am also a part of that particular group that got cut off. We are surviving, and uh, we are hoping that things get better. We're praying that things get better, and actually it is hard for us. But I'm, at, I'm also here representing Brady. Brady is a non-violence, gun-controlling group that's based out of Washington, D.C. And I would like for everyone to just go to the Brady Against Violence group and see the things we are doing. You don't have to uh, uh, go and parade a kind word to somebody, uh, asking uh, or willing to lend a helping hand as these groups that are developed, and I, think, I am thankful that they are developed, you as a person can do something to put a smile on somebody's face. It's beautiful. Uh, thank you, everybody. And one last word to Chief White. The last event we was at, you, you were wondering how come I wasn't so uh, boisterous against the police department. I'm a retired police officer, y'all. I told, uh, you know, you want, I want you to know why. Because you're doing a good job. All right. <laughs> All right. You just made Chief White's night. Go ahead. Hey, Crafty Mike. Last time you said you didn't know nothing about Kenesha Coleman, DPD case 20 1112. It's in the hands of the Michigan State Police. What they're going to find out is Kenesha didn't shoot herself. There's no way possible she took her right hand and put a nine millimeter to her side and pulled the trigger and didn't leave no gun stipplings on her wound. But the homicide um, sergeant talking about is poppycock. Now you said you didn't know. Stephanie Poe told me how her mouth, when she was your executive constituent affairs person, that the mayor is fully aware he'd been apprised. You ain't never mentioned Kenesha's name out your mouth publicly. Here's your day. Now her daughter, Nene, asked me, Mr. Rue, can you give me some help with my mama? I asked her, what you want, sweetheart? After I told her yes, she said, I want them to stop saying my mama killed herself. Y'all ain't done that yet. So right here, 
is a recall hearing letter for you and Fred Door Hall. And I will go through every member of city council. I've been moving and shaking around here for a long time. I'll do it. All right. Well, the great thing about America is uh, that democracy gives you that right. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Tell us your name and where you live. Oh. Yes, my name is Tori Boyd. Um, first of all, I want to say I missed you at the DMC. I worked for DMC for Rhonda Porterfield for 20 years, and you worked right down the hall from her. I remember you. But my concern is um, I've been having problems in my home. Uh, my mom is 80 years old, and she has seven homes in Detroit, and she gave them to me. And um, we've been having mice and everything in our homes. And uh, because of this abandoned home, I have to start with one home first. And I can't go to the other homes because I have to finish this home first. But um, Mona and, Dur and Durham and Durham and Mr. Frederick, I don't know where he is. It started with him. He just been helping me. Frederick, he's a police officer. I don't know where he is. Fra Franklin, I'm sorry, Franklin, he's the best, but I called the land bank about this home next door. They did tear down about two months ago. So I called back to see if I can buy the property. They told me it's a homeowner owns the property. And they say he's out of uh, Florida and it's nothing I can do and just let it go. And they're dumping now. And that's not fair. This home been abandoned for 20 years. Okay. It has mice going okay. inside my home. It's torn okay. down. Hang, and they hang say, on a second. It's a vacant lot next to your house? No, the house was demolished two months ago. Right, but you're saying now it's a vacant lot. Now it's a vacant but lot. But you're saying it's still in the ownership of the private yes, owner. and they said yeah. they have ticketed this person yeah. Yeah. for 30 we, years. So we don't have a legal right to sell a private lot to you. We just we just don't have it. What we can do is enforce, and it sounds like that's what we're doing, on the owner. Yeah, that's 30 years. They, my mom, yeah. that house been. Ah, I know. It's a tough situation. We now have made enough progress. By, by the end of next year, all of the abandoned land bank houses will be demolished. We're now starting to move to private owners who have neglected their houses because it causes you, you don't care if the person next door is land bank or whatever, the, what, what they're doing to your house, you want the house down. My problem is we've sold 25,000 side lots to neighbors, but I just don't have a legal right to sell a private lot. But, but I would not be surprised if you don't see it come up uh, over time. And I don't know if there's a way to find a phone number on the guy, but you might want to uh, offer him a few hundred dollars and see if he'll just uh, give you a title. All right. But thank you for what you're doing. Yes. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start by expressing my sincere appreciation for your emphasis on climate solutions recently, and I'm including the land value tax as a climate solution to encourage density in the city. I really appreciate that. Um, I live in Island View. I live in Council President Sheffield's district, um, and I care a lot about climate change, and <laughs> I know you've heard this, and I, I don't want to make you repeat yourself, but my favorite one of my favorite climate solutions is public transportation. I live without a car, um, and I really rely on the bus service. The DDOT reimagined plan, as um, you know, presented by Director Oglesby, would make my life and the lives of the 20 percent of Detroiters who don't have cars much better. I don't want to make you repeat yourself, but I do believe that bus driver pay would make a big difference. Um, I appreciate that you've raised it, that there are people in the, in the academies, but um, you know, we need to get beyond the original you know, amount that we had before the pandemic and Im improve it. So thank you. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I, I, and so I want you to come back uh, when we do this next year and you come up and I want you to tell me how Michael Staley did the last year improving DDOT. All right. Will you come back and tell us honestly one way or the other? All right. Uh, anybody left on this side? Okay. Yes. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Deputy Mayor, uh, Council President, Council Members, Chief. Uh, my name is Al Martin, lifelong activist here in the community. Started with So Sad, Save Our Sons and Daughters, counseling parents of, of children. Who Clementine Barfield's group. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, later went on, was one of the founding members of Brothers of, of Patrol, one of the founding members of, of BMI, Black Men Incorporated, served the city as the violence, and violence prevention coordinator um, when the deputy mayor and many other members here um, went with me to Boston to take a look at, at one of the plans. I just wanted to, to share just a couple of things with the groups that are, that are here. I applaud everything that everybody is doing, and I appreciate the fact that you've put some money behind some of the initiatives. We created a violence prevention plan that was never funded, so I appreciate what you're doing now. 
I um, wanted to just share just a real quick a brief of, of history and offer my services to anybody who, who is working in the community. Boston had 10 years where a child was not shot or killed, 16 years or younger, for 10 years. They received national acclaim for this. Once they got national acclaim, folks forgot what got them there. So what then happened was Boston then went from a, a city that had no person shot or killed 18, I mean 16 years or younger to one of the highest murder rates in the country because they got national acclaim and it went to people's heads. So what I share with, with you all, and I'd love to assist in any way I possibly can, is now that we've got a little bit of funding, and I hope you open it up for some more, um, I'd like to work with you so that we don't mirror the same things that happened in Boston. We don't want to come back later yeah. on. All right, so I'm sure the groups here will be glad to talk to you. You've been in the streets doing this for a long time. Uh, and this is what this is about. With the six organizations we have, they're partnering uh, with the folks who have been doing it without any support. And uh, it's going to be your expertise that's going to help us. So thank you. Okay, go ahead. We're going we're gonna to finish up the folks in line here, and uh, even though we're, we're running late. Go ahead. Tell us your name and where you live. Uh, hello, Mayor Duggan. My name is Sean Minty. I live in Island View, District 5. Uh, I'm here to hammer on the bus driver pay issue. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think what you're planning to raise it is enough to actually retain the drivers. I know that you keep saying there's a lot of drivers in the academy. But I wouldn't be surprised if you see like 20 or 30 of those drivers drop off because it's a really hard job. It's pretty stressful. Um, the, the amount of time I spend waiting now is like sometimes so insane that like I used to actually complain with people when I'd wait, like that would be the most common thing is you could complain about the times. It's so bad now, like I don't even complain that much anymore. Like people just are sitting there waiting because they know it's not going to come on time. So it's kind of embarrassing, I think, like how little we pay our bus drivers. Like they get 28 in Ann Arbor, any other city, they get like double what we get. These bus drivers like are hurting. People are hurting. They can't get to work on time. Yeah. So I have to deal in facts, and here are the facts. Our senior bus drivers have an extremely low turnover rate, uh, maybe five or six a month who either retire or quit. Our problem has been that at the $14.70 rate, we were not getting any to come into the academy, and our problem was before we put in the attendance payments, we weren't getting folks to show up for work. Uh, and so we'll be judged on what we're doing, uh, but when you go from six or eight a month in the academy class to 40 a month, I'm confident it will make a difference. So uh, the facts will bear themselves out one way or the other. Okay, who's next? Hello, Mr. Mayor. My name is Corrine Ung. My husband is a retiree of the city. He worked there for 30 years. I know you're saying that maybe next year you're hoping that the retirees would get a raise, but what about this year? You got a raise, city council got a raise, we got nothing. Our expenses keep going up. A lot of people are suffering so bad they don't have enough money to pay their bills. A little bit now would help. What was your raise this year? You're not so, going to tell us, are you? So it was 3%. Uh, it's in the paper. Yeah, 3%. Uh, so, what did we uh, get? Uh, and so, again, we, we've got, we have folks who are not telling the whole story. So I wasn't in charge of the bankruptcy, but the retirees, the retirees as a group voted on the option with the 10-year freeze. They voted overwhelmingly to take that option. I, I didn't vote that option. And so, so we, right, we got out of bankruptcy in December of 2014. We will, as I'm saying, I will be evaluating what we can do next year. Next year, we got next out of year. we got out of we're bankruptcy. Every year I'm sorry. Until 2025. And, and so, we're not. Uh, you just I, don't get it. I, I do get it. I can count to ten. Okay, 2024 is when we're ten years out of bankruptcy. 
Okay, that was what the retirees agreed to. And we put aside $420 million to make sure you weren't hit again with the intention after 10 years to address it. You can be angry about that, but that's what the retiree, that's what the retiree group, it, this is what the retiree group voted for and is in the bankruptcy order that I'm obligated to follow. So I, I don't know what else to tell you. Then don't get a raise. Okay. You and your counsel don't okay. get a raise. Then. All right. Uh, next, well, next, does the next person, does the next person have a question? Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. Mayor. Um, so I, it was exciting to hear that you're starting to get new people into the DDOT Driver Academy, but there's one problem. They're all gonna leave, go to other systems like Ann Arbor where they pay like 28 an hour, or maybe across the border, Windsor, where they pay, I believe, 26 an hour. You know, this issue's just been a continuing issue, and you know, um, the other day, um, a pretty high-ranking ATU um, guy, he um, interviewed um, with Outliner Detroit, and here's what he said. We were never in negotiation with the city about an increase. That's a narrative people would like people to believe. And you know, he also said the city is requesting the unions make concessions in exchange for pay increase, which he obviously said was unacceptable. But I just want to okay. say- so let, let, Wait, let me see if I follow that. One, we didn't have the conversation. And two, when we had the conversation, I asked for something. Those are his two statements. All right, go ahead. You can see what I'm dealing with. Uh, anything else anybody wants to talk about? Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor. My name is Robert Pulowski. I'm a high school student from Southgate, Michigan, and a longtime transit rider going on eight years and six years fighting for public transit. I've been taking the buses for as long as I can remember, and I know the backbone of this city is public transit. I also like to reduce the carbon footprint, co contributing to the climate change crisis, but also finding better ways to get around public transit. Um, not to go ahead and repeat yourself, um, I see everybody's point of view here today. The point of view that we're trying to make is how can we be a competitive system and have a good pay? You have the cities of Toledo, you have the cities of Windsor, city of Ann Arbor, you have the regional suburban neighborhoods that are paying double the amount of money than our regular system here in Detroit. These so. drivers have a backbone. These drivers have life here in the city and I fight for them every day. And I just want to hear your take on what do you want to do in the near future to help these drivers, but also they make this the most thriving system here in the city of Detroit. So and I'd also I know like everybody happen. came in with their talking points. I don't know how I can be any clearer. We got 135 buses on the street today. Uh, Michael Staley's responsibility is to get up to 155 by January, 175 by April, 195 by September, full staffing next year. We have a plan. Everybody has all these prognostications. Uh, we have a plan. You're going to be able to measure whether we make it or not. All right, I just want to say thank you. We went about an hour over, but uh, it was great for all the folks that came out. Thank you again for our CVI partners, uh, and we'll see you soon.